Hi, I'm Shiro Armstrong from the Crawford School of Public Policy here at the ANU, and I'm joined today by Professor Mari Pangestu, who's an ANU graduate, former Indonesian trade minister, and current honorary professor of the Crawford School at ANU. So welcome, Mari. Thank you, Shiro. Now, we're talking on the sidelines of the ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. Um, we've just had a panel on the trading system. Um, what are the main issues in the global trading arena? I think the clear and present danger is uh, the collapse of the world trading system as we know it today. I mean, the U.S., which had for 70 years been the supporter and the leader, taking the leadership on this, is now actually the biggest threat, you know, as, as uh, I think we all talked about uh, earlier. Uh, and, and it's not just the U.S. Uh, threatening uh, to uh, th uh, destroy the system, but the way it is doing uh, unilateral protectionism and how China or other countries respond to it is also a key uh, integral part of how the world trading system seems to be spiraling, spiraling downward. Uh, because you are seeing countries like Australia asking for exemptions from the tariffs, uh, potential retaliation and tit for tat uh, and bilateral uh, dealings with it rather than uh, using the rules-based uh, trading system, especially the dispute settlement mechanism. And I think if we, if we went that route uh, and we end, actually ended up with a trade war, uh, the effect on uh, trade, the effect on growth, of prosperity, poverty reduction is, is really going to be under threat. And, and this is something that we really uh, should avoid. So what should countries like Indonesia or Australia do in this situation? Doing nothing is not an option. This is what I kept on saying. Even though, uh, obviously, at the moment, it seems like uh, con uh, countries, just because of the unpredictability of the nature of Trump's uh, and the US uh, actions, uh, we are a little bit sort of struggling with how, how to respond. And so far, the response has been a combination of asking for exemptions and trying to make bilateral deals, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is really not going to help us uh, with the with maintaining the open and rules-based trading system, which has benefited not just us, Australia, Asia, but also the world and all the U.S. Not to mention, uh, so I think our role, uh, our our choice is really uh, not not to do nothing, but to continue this process. Now, how how should we continue? the process of an open rules-based trading system. And on top of that, given that we know that the, the kind of the underlying uh, pressure uh, from, uh, for, for anti-globalization, for protectionism, is coming from this unequal distribution of benefits from trade, we also need to pay attention at the same time to have the complementary policies on structural adjustment, whether it's safety nets, whether it's the transition for sectors and regions which are affected uh, by globalization or technological change for that matter, also needs to be uh, combined with the policies of continued openness. Now, continued openness uh, means that we, s we have to have a shared vision uh, of continued openness, which is also equitable, uh, as well as that countries that, that are a bit more advanced or have more should be able to give more right, to the lesser developed countries or, or countries which are not in a position uh, to give more. So it means that there has to be a coalition of willing, open countries uh, which uh, will uh, pursue this public good which we can call an open and rules-based and equitable trading system uh, and give more and, and continue the processes of opening up, whether it's multilateral, whether it's regional, as well as doing unilateral reforms. So when I say multilateral, I think we, we, we have to work very hard uh, to support and continue to maintain uh, the world trading system, uh, the, the world multilateral world trading system, the WTO, especially the dispute settlement mechanism, which we know the US is uh, really uh, disregarding and even uh, with the their uh, veto on uh, nomination of appellate judges to the dispute settlement appellate body, 
uh, they are actually effectively ma making it ineffective and maybe incapacitating it in, in, in by next year. Yeah. So this is, I think, number one priority, apart from all the reforms that we need to do within the WTO. So there has to be a collective leadership, probably coming from China, Japan, uh, and EU as the major big countries, and middle powers and friendlies, uh, as, as Craig uh, used the term, like Australia, like Indonesia and ASEAN and Korea, uh, and I think some of the Latin American countries. So the, the, this coalition of like-minded countries with a shared vision should continue to pursue uh, on the multilateral side. On the regional side, obviously, we have CPT, CPTPP or TPP11 as, as one of the uh, mega regionals that, that can continue the process of opening up. And one that involves uh, ASEAN, Indonesia and Australia is obviously RCEP. I think completion of the negotiations of RCEP will send a very, very important and clear signal that this part of the world, this region, in intends to continue the process of opening up, whatever uh, the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. And finally, of course, uh, unilateral reforms and structural reforms, which we will need to do to continue growth uh, and development. Uh, and while we are doing this, it's kind of like a minus U.S. world, but at the same time, the U.S. is the U.S. It is still a major country, and it's a big minus, right? So we still need to find ways to engage the U.S., whether it's through APAC, whether it's through other mechanisms, uh, we, we need to continue to engage the U.S. You, you mentioned the RCEP agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. How important is that, and, and what are the prospects for getting that completed anytime soon? I think it's important. I mean, when we had TPP 11, 12 and, and RCEP, they were about equal in size. Uh, but now uh, with uh, TPP 11, actually RCEP is bigger e economically. Yeah? It's half the world's population, it's 30% of GDP, 30% of world trade. So whatever we do, I think, will have an impact, not just for our region, but also uh, for uh, globally. Yeah? Uh, and I think the prospects hopefully are uh, relatively positive that we can complete some substantial part of the negotiations this year. So even if you had the framework and the principles of agreement in place this year, that would still continue to send an important signal. So substantial progress is, is the minimum we hope for. The maximum we hope for is the completion of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, there's a high level of com commitment uh, from our president um, uh, to uh, complete the RCEP negotiations and solidifying the ASEAN position within the RCEP negotiations negotiations and then hopefully you'll find kind of a middle ground landing zone between the high level of ambition from Australia, Japan and, and from the lower ambition of India. So we have to come uh, to, to some level of uh, landing zone which is not the end of the story. You know, we should look at this as a process and uh, in, in, the, in the near future, you can continue to improve uh, uh, these commitments going forward. So you continue the process of opening up. Yep, a, a living agreement. Uh, yeah, a living agreement, that's right. So you mentioned doing nothing is not an option. What happens if we do nothing and the system unravels? What is that gonna look like in 12 months time? Well, if it actually unravels, you have a trade war and you you, you have the collapse of the WTO, uh, then I think we are in, in really, really bad uh, situation. I think a, a lot of scenarios uh, and modeling have been done to show that you're going to end up uh, probably worse than uh, the situation like the Great Recession in the 1930s. I think uh, there was a, a estimation by the WTO, if you went back to the level of tariffs and level of protection before the multilateral trading system, world trade would go down by 60% and uh, the world economy would contract by minus 2.4%. And then if you actually had a US-China trade war, that would really compound uh, the situation. You'd have all countries looking inward again and beggar thy neighbor kind of policies. Uh, and that would be re very disastrous, especially for small open economies like Australia, uh, like Indonesia. And for developing countries, you know, you're asking developing countries with hundreds and millions of people still in poverty, uh, being, you know, continuing to be impoverished. Well, with your three-pronged plan of multilateral, regional and unilateral, hopefully we can avoid that, that outcome. Uh, thank you very much, yes. Mari Pungas. Thank you. Too.